Let's have a look. Hello and a welcome to today's Truth Proof. We are live tonight from the UK, broadcasting from, uh, to the UK and around the world. Great guest on tonight, but first of all, I've got to say thank you everybody for coming on the live stream tonight. Uh, we know you've been enjoying them of late, and we've got a great guest on, as I say. Uh, I've just got to welcome a few people into the chat. I've got uh, Al, uh, who was in the chat. Welcome, Al. Skyflower, by the way, is doing the moderating tonight. Uh, welcome to the show, Sky, and thanks for all your help. Uh, I have, um, let's have a look, we've got Tony D. We have Kevin, Kevin White, uh, Nigel Logan, uh, Mally Dodgson. Uh, welcome, Mally. And um, Karen Taylor, Steph J, Lisa Odd. And I'm just scrolling through. Apologise if I miss anybody else. Stargazer Eternal 1 is in the chat. We have... So look, I think I picked... Oh, Kim King is in tonight. And The Revenants. Welcome, The Revenants. Good supporter of the show. And Bob's in, saying hello. And... Let's have a look. Ian Linford, Ralph Winter. Great. Uh, great to see you all in. Yeah, so as I say, welcome to the show. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping there. Hope you've all been well. And it looks like I can run with tonight's intro. And let's just hope this week it actually works. See you the other side. seconds here. So, as I say, hope you've all had a good week. Now, for the main part of the show... We'll bring on Paul and his guest. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Les. Another week, and uh, it's own rolls round, and uh, I'm really looking forward to tonight. I need to say straight away, though, that Ken has got a lot of time constraints to this this coming week and in his life, so we're only going to get an hour with Ken. So it'll be me and Les afterwards. But uh, we're talking to Ken Gerhard, and uh, yeah, what a fabulous guest, uh, cryptozoologist, author, researcher of strange creatures worldwide. Uh, Ken's often called upon to participate in documentaries and give advice regarding cryptid sightings, uh, such as Bigfoot, Mothman, flying humanoids, and the incredible werewolf phenomena. That's, I'm only scratching the surface. He's also written six books. So Ken, welcome to Truth Proof. Thank you so much, Paul. It's uh, absolutely an honor to be here with you. So uh, right. I appreciate you having, having me on. I'm sure that there'll be a lot of people within the chat who've seen you on documentaries and seen you giving your advice and your opinion and visiting various locations. But first of all, Ken, just give us a little background on Ken Gerhard. How did this begin? Is it something that stems back from childhood or are we going in later years? Yeah, well, uh, obviously, I get asked that a lot. Uh, cryptozoology is not a, a very big field, and it's kind of an unusual, <laughs> untraditional pursuit. Um, what I tell people is that it's just been a lifelong passion and interest of mine. When I was, uh, I grew up, uh, my father was a, a science professor, forestry professor, so I grew up in kind of a, a scientific family, and um, we spent a lot of time in the outdoors. Uh, growing up in Minnesota and then Texas. Um, my mother was a travel agent and was very adventurous. Um, I loved animals and creatures when I was a kid. My first pet was a caiman, which is a small alligator. I used to collect snakes and salamanders and all kinds of creepy crawlies out in the woods. Uh, so I loved animals and I also loved monster movies. I grew up, of course, with Godzilla, King Kong, the creature from the Black Lagoon and all that stuff. So when I first saw a TV show about Bigfoot, I was about eight or nine years old. It was just like a light went off because it combined and embodied all of the things that I loved. Here was this 
real life monster potentially stalking the woods of North America, as well as, you know, presumably an animal, some kind of unknown animal or creature out in the woods. So I just, uh, something I studied, immersed myself in for my whole life. My mother was a huge influence. She took me all over the world as a travel agent. I got, uh, she got great discounts. So we, we camped along the Amazon river and, uh, Machu Picchu, Stonehenge, uh, Australia, Africa, Asia, and uh, wherever I went as a kid, I was always interested in the local legends of creatures, whether it was the bunyip or the tatsil worm or whatever. And then when I was at 15 years old, my mother arranged for my father and I to vacation at Loch Ness. And uh, uh, my father did quite a bit of fishing. I guess he wasn't as interested in the Nessie as I was, but I spent a lot of time. I had an eight millimeter movie camera and I was camped out by the lake and interviewing the locals and things. So that was kind of my first attempt at field research. So where I've been very blessed, I never planned to make this a lifelong career, but uh, I started writing books, uh, you know, a number of years ago and um, got on some TV shows and um, yeah, here I am. There you are. And uh, I've heard you described as the Indiana Jones of, of cryptid research and cryptid hunting. And it's, it's, it's interesting because you, you've, you've got a vast knowledge. I've listened to podcasts and I've listened to you on TV. And, and it's great you've put the field work in. But just before, I'd, I'd like to talk about Bigfoot for a little bit first, but just before you do, I noted that you, the science-based background and your, your parents, what do they think or what did they think as you started reaching out into this field? Well, it's funny you mentioned Indiana Jones. I think my mother actually fancied me to be an archaeologist because she'd take me to a lot of places where there were ancient ruins be it in mexico or i visited all the pyramids in mexico and central america she took me to the ruins of carthage and tunisia and all these you know so she she was very much interested in in the archaeology so i guess she kind of thought that's what i might do but um uh, my mother passed when i was younger as i said she was a huge influence she used to talk about the Yeti and the Mount, the Mothman and all these fabulous creatures. My father's still alive and um, I'm actually going to see him here in a little while. And he's very proud of me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, he's uh, retired now, obviously he's 85 years old, but uh, he, he was a math high school math teacher towards the end of his career. And uh, he told me that on the first day of school, he used to fire up some of my TV shows and things for the students. <laughs> They're just gonna watch. It. This is my son chasing Bigfoot. So, uh, so that's pretty cool. You know, everybody wants yeah. you want your parents to be proud of you. And obviously, um, some people view me as a professional weirdo. So uh, that's it's pretty cool that my <laughs> father is does... so supportive. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. So Bigfoot. What is Bigfoot? Is he a fur covered hominid or? Is he is he something else, or is he hyper elusive, and he's actually residing in the forests and deep dark places are all around the world? What's your opinion, or is he all well, of them things? Well, first and foremost, Bigfoot is the rock star of cryptozoology, as I call him. Uh, you know, it seems to be the most popular cryptid for I think understandable reasons because it seems to look very much like us. At least people describe the way it moves and things. Um, I've been investigating Bigfoot or Sasquatch, as I said, since I was eight or nine years old. Um, I've been doing field research for decades. I've worked with pretty much all of the leading investigators in North America. I've done field research from Alaska to British Columbia, the Pacific Northwest, Florida, Texas, Louisiana, down into Central America. In fact, Paul, there are sightings of Bigfoot yep. like creatures in Mexico and Central America as well. And in my decades of research, I've never seen one. Uh, I'm no. convinced I've heard them vocalize a few times on a few occasions, and I found other evidence, footprints and uh, things like that. Um, I think that Bigfoot, in my opinion, Bigfoot is an undiscovered relict hominin. That is a human ancestor, maybe not our direct ancestor, but kind of a side branch, a cousin, if you will. Um, and I think the most likely theory these days is that it is a perhaps descended from something known as Paranthropus boisei, which was an African hominin that lived about a million years ago in East and South Africa. And um, it looked just like Bigfoot, just like what people describe. I've interviewed hundreds of eyewitnesses and they're pretty consistent. And it looked like a little Bigfoot. 
And so I guess one possibility is that it somehow survived and traveled from Africa or migrated from Africa throughout Asia, radiated into North America across the land bridge and maybe other parts of the world too. And um, that it got bigger during the ice age, you know, during the Pleistocene, there were many species that got massive in size because of the cold temperatures of something called Bergman's rule. So you had the big woolly mammoths and giant bears and beavers and things. So perhaps a gigantic evolved descended form of some type of Paranthropus or robust Australopithecine. I think that's the most probable thing. I'm not really, I haven't really seen much evidence. I know people like to ask me whether they, I think Bigfoot could be quote unquote interdimensional or extraterrestrial mm -hmm. or any of those things, something uh, beyond supernatural in, in, in form. I haven't really seen, nope, nope. I've seen very, very little evidence of that. And I understand that there are accounts that sound, that go into those kind of weird areas. Uh, people often talk about Native American perspectives of, about spirituality and stuff. Um, so that's that's just my perspective, and I'm open-minded. So as I tell people, if, if someone wants to show me a Bigfoot walking out of a portal from another dimension, I will immediately acknowledge that that is where they're coming from. But yeah, I don't well, think that, that's, that's the most probable at this point. That's a, that, that's a good enough answer, Ken. Quite honestly, it is. How, how do we explain... And you must have spoken to witnesses that so these things are almost floating. They're moving so smoothly. I'm not expecting mm -hmm. an answer as, as you know, a, a definite answer because we don't know. But uh, and and the fact that uh, I'm not in the portal camp. I'm not in any camp. It's open to me. I don't know. But you, what about the light form phenomena that people see in the forests with the sightings of these creatures? Yeah, no, that's, you know, as I said, there are some strange accounts with orbs and people talk about Bigfoot's cloaking, vanishing, mind speak, telepathy, some of those types of things. Um, kind of my, my concession or my acknowledgement, Paul, typically is there could be a, 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 another form, another phenomenon, perhaps that looks like Bigfoot or manifests in a way that seems like a Bigfoot. and you know, that would that would explain those types of reports. That is something that's essentially emulating the Bigfoot or the Sasquatch, or at least that's the way that we interpret it or, or perceive right, it. Right, okay. And like a big hairy ape man. And if that's the case, then you, we could make a very strong argument that that is in fact the same mechanism or phenomenon that also explains the dogman sightings, werewolf sightings, mothman sightings, and all of these different monsters that have been reported around the world and often associated with more of a supernatural you know aspects yeah, and things so, like so that supernatural element i suppose when the witness is describing them doing these i mean it's it's incredible enough to see such a creature but when witnesses describing them doing these strange movements and seemingly vanishing that we they are looking at the sort of our otherworldly realm uh, that's that's the direction they're going in but it could be just some kind of science that we don't understand i, I really don't know myself but ken what's the most convincing uh account that you've heard or or where's the the place the strongest place in the world where you're probably going to get the experience of the bigfoot well i'd say uh based on the evidence that we've accumulated over over the decades i would say bluff creek california um you know the birth of bigfoot in 1958 when jerry crew began finding strange footprints around his bulldozer and cast some of those that's when the bigfoot became worldwide news and of course, the Patterson Gimlin film of October 20th, 1967, which is the gold standard of photographic evidence. I'm convinced that is a, that is an actual living Sasquatch walking in that film. Um, I was at the film site and Bluff Creek a couple of years ago. Um, got to visit the film site for the first time. It's changed, of course, as far as how it looks, but it gave me quite a perspective in terms of the surrounding habitat and stuff. So I would say Northern California, Bluff Creek, I think that due to lower population densities, there actually probably is a higher population of Bigfoots or Sasquatches in British Columbia, the coastal ranges of British Columbia, Canada, and also going up into Alaska. But due to low human population densities in those areas, there aren't as many sightings and reports. There are, of course, mm -hmm. native traditions that go back centuries that describe these creatures in a, in a number of different names, Junaqua, Bukwus, uh, Gilyuk, Gagat, and so forth. So 
Um, so yeah, Pacific Northwest. Now, obviously, we have we can talk about the global aspect and the reports of things yeah. like the Yeti, the Yaren, Yaoi. Uh, and, and do you think we're and, dealing with essentially the same thing, just a different variant of it? Sure, subspecies. Yeah. And I think yeah. the perfect uh, comparison would be black bears because it, if you find one of the things we find or I find in my Bigfoot research here in North America is the areas where the reported seem to overlap perfectly with populations of black bears. Now, the skeptics argue, well, that's what people are seeing. They're just seeing black bears and thinking they're Bigfoots. But I think it's more in terms of an ecological niche and the fact that Bigfoots about the same size or bigger, but have similar diets. They're opportunistic omnivores. They eat a lot of the same things and so forth. Good food supplies, good resources. But Black bears are obviously can also be found in Asia, uh, you know, in parts of India. There's sub there's something like eight subspecies of black bears around the world. So I think we could be dealing with a similar phenomenon where we have basically yeah. subspecies or uh, generalized populations because they've been isolated from each other, just as you would expect in any population of animals. You have different types of physical and behavioral adaptations that occur that create these slight variations. So. Still the yeah, same species, but perhaps just some some slight differences there. And during course of your research, are there sort of good ones and bad ones? Have you heard about fatalities, human fatalities, or or, or people that have suggested that they've been attacked? Well, not not very much, and I think you know this is just my opinion perspective. And in fact, on my the cover to my Bigfoot book, the Essential Guide to Bigfoot, I clearly show, and I had the artist kind of con constructed so that the Bigfoot in the picture was as afraid of the human as the human was of the Bigfoot. I think, yeah. I really think they are afraid of us. Uh, well, I think, let me put this another way. I think that they've adapted behavioral uh, things that there are avoidance. behavioral adaptations, avoidance behaviors that they yeah. want. They recognize that we are their greatest threat to extinction. And so that they, you know, they don't want to be around us very often. And in fact, if you look at the Patterson Gimlin film, there's a clear demonstration of that two guys right up on horseback, they surprise a Bigfoot. What does she do? She walks off into the woods quickly and looks over her shoulders to make sure they're not following her. Um, you know, just like any animal, Paul, I think there can be territorial attacks yep. and maybe they're protecting their young. So those prop, those incidents do happen. But one of I feel like one of my roles in the field of cryptozoology is kind of to demonsterize some of these traditional cryptids. Now, we can certainly talk about other cryptids that might be considered monsters like werewolves and mothman and so forth. But Bigfoot, I put in a different category. Yeah, yeah. And there are, of course, accounts. Um, you know, there's a, a town in Alaska that I investigated called uh, Port Luck, uh, Port Chatham, where there was, you know, in, in 1949 and in the early 50s, this town was allegedly evacuated because. Is this the, the fishing town? Yeah, the fishing yeah, village yeah. in Alaska. The fishing village, that. yeah. That's an example of people that have been bodies had turned up and people thought that this Bigfoot was a bit uh, responsible. There's, of course, the famous Bauman account that Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, wrote about in Wilderness Hunter about this trapper in Idaho that got killed by a, a, what sounds like a Bigfoot. So, there, you know, you get those those accounts here and there, but I don't think they're out to get us, Paul. And I think no. that's, well, you know. Well, there again, Ken, I suppose if somebody encountered one of these things and shot at it, then what are you going to do? You, you, it, it, the, the natural thing to do would probably to fight back, you know, so there's bound to be fatalities. It doesn't mean that they're, they're all naturally aggressive. I, I agree. So, and you said that primarily you think these things are omnivorous. They're not just carnivores as such. Well, I suppose the teeth dictate that when people describe the teeth, don't they? So the, yeah, the diet's yeah. varied. Yeah, I mean, there's the evidence of that is in terms of the eyewitness accounts. I mean, there are accounts of them eating grasses, berries, um, fish, obviously mollusks, I think, are a major food source. I think the the clam beaches of British Columbia and some of those parts are probably, you know, beneficial. Um, so, yeah, they're opportunistic. They probably eat a lot of different things. It's interesting you bring up the teeth because, and you know, granted, a lot of people don't get typically a good you know view of the teeth for whatever reason the sightings are at night they're fleeting the mouth is not open uh but people that have claimed that seen the teeth claim that they're kind of big and square for the most yeah. part and that they have kind of reduced canine teeth compared to the other great apes including us which is interesting and uh paranthropus again was the same way it was 
essentially had evolved as primarily something that ate a lot of heavy grasses and things that were chewy. And so it had these big square teeth, although paleontologists or sorry, paleoanthropologists now feel that maybe that Paranthropus also did eat some meat and lived in forested areas. So there may have been a, a progression where it became more of a, a, yeah. a meat eating species, if that's what we're dealing with. Okay, thanks, Ken. That's that's brilliant. And just want to break into people in chat. If you've got any questions for Ken, can you put them in block capitals, please? And Sky will get them through till Les. And uh, uh, can we move away from Bigfoot? Because I realise we've only got 60 minutes with, with you to, today, Ken. And uh, we'll talk about other cryptids, dogman, werewolf. And uh, as dogman and werewolf, in your opinion, are they the same thing? I mean, yeah, I would say so. And, you know, it's interesting... Uh, I'm obviously I, I try to follow a zoological blueprint in terms of my research. In fact, I work with a zoo here in San Antonio. But in the world of uh, zoological classification, there are lumpers and splitters. Lumpers are people that will say a black bear is a black bear, and then splitters are people that will say, well, there's eight subspecies. You got the Himalayan yeah, black yeah. bear, whatever. So it's funny in the world of zoology. I'm traditional zoology, Paul, I'm, I feel like I'm more of a splitter. I like talking about different subspecies and variations, yeah. but in terms of the cryptid world, I tend to be more of a lumper. And that's because, you know, we're dealing with highly improbable concepts that these legendary creatures actually do exist. So if they do exist, it's even less likely that there are different variations and types. You know, it's more likely that they are basically the same phenomenon or the same creatures and that people, individuals interpret them slightly differently, you know? Yeah. And there might be some variation within a species. Now, dogman, I don't think is a species per se. I view that as more of like a supernatural construct. And actually there are a lot of parallels to flying humanoids like Mothman. And I know the werewolf dogman group doesn't always want to hear about that, but I've interviewed many eyewitnesses of Mothman type creatures. I've investigated those in different parts of North America. Of course, over there in the UK, you have the Owl Man of uh, yeah. uh, down there in Cornwall, and I it seems very similar in terms of the hyper aggressive behavior, the combination of human and animal like characteristics, and you know other weird lights in the sky and other weird supernatural things that happen. So, so I view so werewolf can... and dog man is basically the same thing. Yes, I, I, and I, I would agree. I think same. I just think it's a. I don't mean it's a bad name. I just think it's another name to. to to rebrand something that's been named the werewolf for a long time. Sure. Uh, but, so you, you talked on the supernatural element potentially with, with these type of cryptid uh, phenomena. Where do you stand on that then? Do you believe, do you believe it's real in, in your heart after speaking to so many witnesses? Uh, is there some substance to this? Well, not I know to where you stand Paul. with them. I'm, yeah, I don't really, I don't really, no, I was going to, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish the question. No, I know where you stand now with the Bigfoot. I just wondered if we're in a different camp with, with the dogman phenomena. And I'm calling it phenomena because I don't know. Yeah. He, he seems to be growing in popular, popularity. And I don't know whether it's because it's being seen more or whether it's because people are more open to speaking about it because people just are being more bold. Uh -huh. I, I don't, I haven't got an handle on why we're getting more and more of these reports. Yeah, that is interesting. You're right. Um, well, not to be prickly, but I, I tend to stay away from the word belief because that okay. implies more of a spiritual, Reli yeah. religious or, or a desire for something to be real just because, you know, it would be cool. But uh, I, you know, again, if I'm going to be scientific about it, I have to look at the da the data, the evidence. Now, I think there is sufficient data and evidence that there are phenomena in our world that we just do not understand and grasp. And this and includes some of these phenomena that are labeled as ghosts, UAPs or UFOs. Uh, I'm very open-minded. I've seen a UFO. I've seen doors slam in haunted, supposedly haunted locations and heard things like that, weird sounds. Um, and I surely, if there are these supernatural, metaphysical, however you want to characterize them, really beyond our comprehension and beyond our current yeah. understanding, then yes, I think that is the category that we would have to put it the werewolves and Mothman and perhaps some of those weird Bigfoot encounters we were talking about earlier and, you know, other strange cryptids and creatures that have been reported around the world. 
Well, brilliant, thank you. I may jump back to this werewolf phenomenon in a moment, but just before I forget, I just you've just noted you've seen a UFO. Tell us about it, Ken, please. Yes. Well, it's it's kind of ironic because I was actually doing a Bigfoot investigation at the time, and I I don't personally connect those two things. I don't I don't I guess there are people that could make an argument for that. But um, I was at a location called Charles Mill Lake, which is in Mansfield, Ohio, in South Central Ohio. And there have been sightings of Bigfoot type creatures, excuse me, around Charles Mill Lake dating back years. So I went out there at night for a nighttime stakeout with another investigator. And we were just kind of sitting out there and listening and trying to trying to be observant. And suddenly this black and, you know, I should point out that earlier in the evening, of course, there were a number of airplanes that had passed over the lake. And, you know, you hear the engine sound, you recognize the little flashing lights in the wings. The, uh, that's an airplane. This thing was completely silent. It was a black triangle. It's huge. And it just kind of slowly came over the lake and passed right over our heads. And it did have three points of light on each point of the triangle and I think they were like alternating different colors or they were definitely different colors now unfortunately I didn't have the right photographic equipment with me at that time I wasn't expecting to be taking nighttime sky photographs and I don't know if it would have done much good anyways Paul because this thing's literally no. just a big black silhouette with three lights but it was totally quiet didn't make any noise it seemed to be pretty huge it's hard to tell how far up high up it was but it was you know and so that was my UFO sighting at a, at a lake where there was where there were Bigfoot reports. And again, I guess someone could make that argument that there is a connection there. To me, that's not enough. I think, um, you know, people that tend to go out, Paul, like us into the woods at night and bump around where we're going to see all kinds of weird things out there. You know, I think that's true. Yeah, you may yeah, be looking for a werewolf and there just happens to be a UFO or a ghost or, you know, whatever. And I just think that's I think that's a byproduct of just going out at night and and you know kind of doing a surveillance you know in a spooky location is there anywhere in the world that you've that you've not been that you'd like to go like to spend some time researching oh several but uh right before the pandemic hit uh, i was talking to some uh people down in australia about doing a tasmanian expedition to search for the the thylacine or the the so-called tasmanian tiger tasmanian wolf Thylus sinus, sinocephalus. Uh, that's a pretty exciting cryptid, which I've never searched for. And unfortunately, it did kind of fall through because of COVID and kind of lost communication with that group. But hopefully that will opportunity will resurface. So I'd love to go down to, to Tasmania. I think there's a very strong probability that these marsupial, carnivorous marsupials, which we know they were around at least until 1936, and there have been hundreds of sightings and some uh, intriguing videos, including in, in mainland Australia as well, where they may have gotten to as well. So there's, there's um, some old photographs of them in around yeah, still, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some good photographs. A guy named Kurt Cameron in the 80s in Western Australia. But the the, the footage is uh, the main footage is the called the Doyle footage from 1973, which was filmed in in Southwest Australia, and that's kind of kind of convincing. So. Yeah, uh, you know, maybe not as romantic as a werewolf or a Bigfoot, but uh, I think if they were still discovered alive and well, that it would certainly jolt the scientific world into, you know, looking at things like Bigfoot and lake monsters in a different way. So so then, how, how do we get mainstream science on board with what you're looking into, what I'm interested in and looking into here in the UK? Uh, I, I'm assuming that you've you've spoke to scientists and reached out of you. Know, uh, well, yeah, and you know, we, there are a, a handful of scientists that should be acknowledged that have gotten in, involved in the in the field of cryptozoology through the years. Uh, uh, Dr. Roy Mackle, who passed away a few years ago, was was at Loch Ness for a number of years and went to the Africa to search for the the living dinosaurs, Michele and Bembe. Dr. Grover Krantz, the late physical anthropologist, who was very active in Bigfoot research. Currently, we have Dr. Jeff Meldrum, another physical anthropologist yep. from Idaho State. Um, Dr. Carl Schuker there in England is a pretty, pretty brilliant comparative physiologist. Um, I work with a PhD, Dr. Haskell Hart, who's now we're now working on trying to collect Bigfoot DNA. He's a PhD from Harvard. So, you know, Jane Goodall's come out, uh, said yeah, some yeah. kind things. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a slow process but i think the problem obviously paul is that well two problems one which is understandable 
you know, and that is that scientists are trained to look at things in terms of, you know, physical evidence and thus far everything we've got in terms of Bigfoot and some of these other cryptids, it's, it's, it's almost all anecdotal. I will just Legends, say stories, it's, it's, accounts, some controversial photos and videos, sound recordings, but they need, you know, bones, teeth, blood, hair, flesh, DNA. Yeah. Yeah, there needs to be something more than the sound recordings. Well, jump into the Sierra sounds. Have you been mm -hmm. there? Have you have you been to that location and spent time there? I have not been to that location. Um, I do know Ron Moorhead, who was one of the gentlemen that recorded those sounds. And um, interestingly, he's, you know, on the opposite side of the fence with Bigfoot. He thinks that Bigfoot is more of a supernatural, you know, he refers to quantum physics and other dimensions and things. And Ron and I actually get along quite well. Last year, we did an event together and we hung out on a patio all night and we agreed to disagree, which I... Do you know, I, you're, you're saying things that I was going to actually say, can there? Because, I mean, we can all agree to disagree, can't we? Yeah, we don't have to fall out know. about it, do we? You know, and uh, I, I love viewpoint and, and stand that you've got on on the subject. You touched on phantom hounds. You, uh, now, here in the UK, along the eastern North Yorkshire coast, where I'm based... We've got lots of folklore out of, of the phantom hounds with huge glowing eyes. Do you get stories like that in the United States? And how much how much truth do you place in the stories of folklore? Um, interestingly, not as many stories, at least I don't. Now, I think no. uh, I live in San Antonio, Texas, which is, uh, at least in terms of, of the U.S., is a very old city with a lot of history dating back to... Spanish colonization in the early 1700s. I know that doesn't seem like much to you folks over there in Europe, but um, <coughs> there's there's a lot of history around these old Spanish missions on the south side of town. And um, I did have a gentleman contact me one time that swears that he saw what sounds like a phantom dog lurking in that area. He said it was not black, but it was actually white and very shaggy. And this is when he was a kid. He was riding his bike through that area, through a neighborhood, and he said that he saw this this strange looking shaggy white dog, very ferocious looking. I don't remember him saying if the eyes glowed or not. I'll have to remember that. But um, but he did say it began to like sort of shake and tremble as he came up on it. And before his very eyes, this thing started to grow and it grew from the size of a normal dog into this giant menacing thing. And then it just kind of dissipated and vanished. So that was kind of a cool I guess white dog. <laughs> Would yeah. You guys it's, it's, have that variation over there, but uh, that was yeah, well, of, do you know? I've got there's a fishing village about four miles from here where I'm sat now, Flamborough, and I've got a, a born and bred Flamborough man walking home, and it's a pretty remote kind of place. There's there's only one road into Flamborough and one road out, and uh, he claims whilst walking back to his home. Uh, late one evening, I'm, I'm assuming he's had a, a drink. Let's hope he weren't too drunk and, he's in, drunk and he's imagining it. But he saw the shadow of a huge dog at the side of him, but he couldn't see the dog. Hmm. Yes. Do you, do you, and I, I don't know what we're looking at. Is that is that the essence of the phantom hound? Is that what people have been seeing? I don't know. I mean, once again, Ken, you hit the nail on the head earlier. We're only dealing with anecdotal evidence. Uh, but when you've got enough of it, when you've got such a volume of it, I think we have to start taking it seriously that they've seen something. Yeah, I would say there's there's sufficient, as I said, I think there's enough evidence in terms of all of these accounts all over the world dating back, you know, centuries of very similar kinds of archetypes, whether it's a yeah. werewolf or a winged humanoid. Now, um, I, 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 I'm not trying to rein in anyone's parade here, Paul, but I will... I, this has kind of been the quote of the year for me. I, uh, I had dinner last year with a neuroscientist here in the States and yes. he had come out to a Bigfoot conference and he was skeptical, but he was interested. So we went out and had dinner with some other folks. And one of the things he was telling me was that after decades of research on the human brain, neuroscientists still really have no idea how it works. It's a total mystery. So, I mean, they know some of the physical things in terms of how memories are formed, where proteins are linked and different things, some of the, but, you know, isn't that interesting, Paul, that we have to acknowledge that 
you know, I'm not saying that this stuff is all imaginary and in our heads. Yeah, yeah, certainly it could be, have, it could be creations have of fact, our minds. We, we have to factor that in. Are, are, are our minds capable of projecting things? And you've heard of these stories of tulpas and thought projections. Yeah. Are we capable of projecting physical constructs into our reality simply by the power of our unconscious minds? And moreover, you know, the, the, the collective power of our unconscious minds. And you bring up a great point with, with the werewolves or the dog man. I mean, certainly yeah. there are traditional histories, you know, traditional legends and things around the world, but why is it that this thing has blown up to the extent it has in recent decades to where, you know, we had a few reports here and there, and now it's like, you know, everywhere, it seems seemingly. So that's, and I've thought that's that cool. myself, you know, on these cliff tops, I've had reports from the cliff tops of Bempton, Flamborough, and Speeton. And it seems like the more we talk about it, the more people are seeing these things. And, you know, I'm not even just, cashing in on what you've said i have actually thought to myself are we creating these things with our own minds uh and obviously i haven't got an answer to that but uh, well haven't you told you told me yourself you were gracious enough to spend some time with me recently on the phone and you said that a number of the eyewitnesses that you interviewed said that the the werewolves they were seeing looked just like these characters out of harry potter movies these yeah, you know, exactly. Werewolves from yeah. from the cinema. So, I mean, one guy we spoke to, Ken, and our listeners will have heard me talk about this, and he saw it running along the cliff tops after it stood up on two legs, and he said, "Have you ever seen the werewolf from Harry Potter?" Well, Bob Brown was with me, and I know Bob's. You've had been on Bob Brown's radio show, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so Bob's Bob heard the story. He had it retold, and uh, yeah, it's a strange one. Are we creating these things? And I. I and it doesn't mean that and make them any less real. It, no, it's no, just it's... the power of what's happening in here that we pot potentially don't understand. They, Ken, they seem to have uh, a physical presence because they, I'm sorry to interrupt, Paul, but you know, no, there you're are not. accounts of them scratching cars and damaging things and banging on walls. So they do have, so you're right. They do have a physical presence or ability when whatever these things are. So if, if you're okay, Ken, we've got 20 minutes left with you. We'd like to ask uh, if you'll answer a few questions. If uh, we'll go to Les and see if he's got any. Sounds good. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yes. Um, great support in the chat tonight. And talking of support, we've got to thank Lee Roscoe for sending in a, a super chat of uh, 20 UK pounds. And he's saying, let's get some answers tonight. So, oh. yeah. Um, <laughs> We've got the uh, right guy on there, uh, Lee. Uh, Ken, you know, he's done uh, tons of research, as you, as you know, by reading his bio and uh, by what he's described tonight. So I'll get on with some questions. I have a question from, uh, oh, Chris M. What's Ken's favourite cryptid subject? Uh, I don't know if he means subject story. Um, subject matter, perhaps. I, I don't know. Yeah, subject matter. Uh, yeah. What's Ken's favourite cryptid subject slash story or whatever? Yeah, I, I uh, actually get that question a lot, obviously, because I, I investigate so many different times of cryptids. And I used to joke about how when people would ask me that, I'd say, well, it's kind of like picking your favourite child. You know, how can you do that? And then I, I, I'm not a parent myself, but eventually I had some parents tell me, well, actually, yeah, you do have a favourite. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that's like okay um i'm sorry i'm being a little bit cheeky there um i would say that uh they're all cool to me uh, for various reasons but uh thunderbirds or, or big birds which i've investigated and written books about and i've interviewed dozens and dozens of witnesses doesn't get a lot of press compared to bigfoot and loch ness and werewolves but uh there are many people uh, that I've interviewed that swear that they've seen these monstrous birds with wingspans 14 to 20 feet across flying around North America, typically uh, dark plumage, solid dark color with a hooked beak, like a raptor or an acipterid, um, very consistent. And then you also have these Native American traditions of quote unquote thunderbirds, which are very widespread, a number of different tribal names, Wakanyan, Huhuk, Pinase, Pomala, Tlanoa. So it's like, you know, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, Paul. Again, no physical yeah. evidence that these things exist, but how magnificent would it be to see a monstrous Fabulous bird way, with yeah. a 15 or 20 foot wingspan flying overhead? That would be pretty cool. 
pretty frightening yeah. as well. After <laughs> yeah, yeah, go on, let's. <laughs> yeah, that, um, yeah, great answer. Uh, Colin Falcon um, is Falcon. asking. Yeah, uh, Colin no, Falcon I'm is too. asking. Yeah, what's? Uh, uh, I don't know how um, how long this subject could go on when I ask this question, but uh, what's Ken's opinion on the phenomena at Skinwalker Ranch? Oh, um, well, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to go to Skinwalker Ranch. I did have an opportunity a few years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't didn't happen. Um, admittedly, I don't really watch the show, although I met some of the gentlemen investigators from that show recently. I was at a, an event called Alien Con here in the U.S. I've heard about Skin Ranch, obviously, like everyone for decades, or at least going back to when George Knapp and others began investigating it maybe in the 90s. Um, uh, what I do know is that I have colleagues that have investigated that area, and it seems like the phenomenon is not restricted to just the boundaries of the ranch. People have That's camped great. out in other adjacent areas and encountered the UFOs or UAPs, uh, the strange dog-like creatures, other ma magnetic anomalies. So yeah, there certainly seem to be spooky spots or triangle areas or however we want to characterize them around the world where yeah, we have kind of increased great. activity of different types of things happening at the same time, whether they're, uh, you know, the intelligent light phenomenon that Paul talks about or spirit activity, ghosts, hauntings, cryptids. I don't know why that is, but I, I certainly think that, that that could be a reason. And of course, that area in Utah has a uh, kind of a reputation in terms of the en endemic tribes, like the Ute Indians that live there viewed that that region evidently is kind of a, a spooky no-go zone when they were around. So that that belief goes back a long time. But, uh, so sure, uh, there's uh, something going on there. I don't know. I'm not going to butt in long because it's questions for Ken, but it goes back a long time and we've got this belief from, from these indigenous, these tribes. Now, surely it's, it, that's because of the strangeness that was happening uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, even though mm -hmm. they've not written it, written about it and documented it and all of its oral, it's uh, it's there. And we're finding that here in the UK and I think it's all over the world. But let me stop. More questions, Les. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Lee Roscoe uh, is asking, what's Ken's take on UFOs using volcanoes? Oh, OK. Well, that's interesting. Um, well, I'm admittedly, I'm, I'm fascinated by the UFO phenomenon, but I'm not really much of, of an investigator in that field, although I have many colleagues and friends that are. Um, when I was up in Alaska filming a show called Missing in Alaska that some of your viewers might be familiar with, we did investigate uh, Mount Hayes, which I think was formerly a volcano. And there's been these long stories and rumors of alien bases underneath that, uh, that mountain. So um beyond that one i'm not sure i'm familiar with a lot of volcanoes that have that kind of uh backstory or that you know that rumor no, going no, on so um so I, yeah i'm afraid i don't have much to offer in terms of that um you know the thing about the the potential of ultra terrestrial intelligences coming to our planet the reality is that the speculation is infinite in terms of if these things really are visiting us where they are, what they're doing, what they're capable of. I mean, it's like, you know, so expansive, right? Because it's really, yep. you know, it's way above any unlimited possibilities. So sure, why why wouldn't they put a base under a volcano? Although the lava might be a problem. I don't, I don't <laughs> I think that, it might be, yeah. You know, like, if it's too active, so so okay. Les, have we any more questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Ken. Uh Lorraine Groves. Now I know you you touched on this one before, but I don't know you want I don't know if you want to add anything to it, uh, Ken. Uh, out of all these creatures, which one fascinates you the most, Ken? Yeah, well, the Thunderbirds. Um, but, I, you know, I think the Bigfoot and other related hominins around the world is pretty fascinating, too, because I'm not saying they're human, and I'm not in that camp, but they're closer to us, if they exist, they're closer to us as a physical species than anything else on the planet, than any of the other great apes, even chimps which share like 98 percent of our dna so i mean they uh there's no one there's no indication that they use tools or fire or anything like to have any technology or culture uh but certainly they you know they move upright like us in a kind of a bipedal fashion um the they seem to have 
Yeah, they're very elusive and they seem to have an intel. I think they would, it would be very telling. A discovery of Bigfoot or something like that would be very monumental in terms of, you know, our history, you know, and where we came from in terms of, I mean, we know we, we're starting to understand a lot more about our evolution as, as humans, as Homo sapiens, but this is, would be a, a, you know, imagine another species coexisting with us on our planet. And I should point out that there were, you know, up to four or five different species of Homo coexisting on our planet until 30, 40,000 years ago. We had Homo yeah. erectus, Neanderthalensis, Denisovans, Luzonensis, and, and so forth. So, um, so yeah, I think that would be pretty telling in terms of, I mean, imagine what we could glean from having another fairly close human relative, you know, that, that we could study. <laughs> Knowing, knowing the way we are as a species, Ken, it wouldn't last long, would it? We'd, we'd either hunt it or exploit it. I mean, we're not exactly renowned for being kind to uh, other animals and other pe things on the planet, are we? Les, another question, please. Yeah, I'm just going to sneak a little question in from my good self, uh, Ken. Oh, uh, and, it, <laughs> and I'm just trying to pick up on what you said earlier. Uh, about uh, the, the, the scientific community getting involved and, and you're looking for uh, tangible evidence, DNA and uh, strands of air, scarce footprints uh, and all that. Uh, but am I not right uh, in saying that people have already put forward their DNA samples, Ken, and hair samples? And if they have, where have they got with us? Well, we don't have any... Um... We don't have any DNA samples that have been associated with Bigfoot or any other cryptid that I'm familiar with that that are actually conclusive. So there is a, a controversial DNA study that went on here in uh, 2012, I think is when the paper was released. And it's sum summarily been kind of discredited as kind of sloppy science. Uh, Brian Sykes, formerly of Oxford, of course, did study. He took studied dozens of samples that people sent him of alleged Bigfoot and Yeti, and none of them really panned out in terms of being something, you know, completely unknown. Uh, the problem is not not the technology so much because with eDNA now we can filter out biological material or DNA from water, soil, air. Um, the problem is in terms of having it sequenced properly which to my understanding, just to have a DNA strand sequence to where we could fit it within the great ape family, it would be a few thousand dollars. And that, that way we, it still wouldn't be conclusive, but we could say, okay, we have this DNA and we're gen blasting it and we're getting human, human, chimp, gorilla, human, orangutan, human. That's interesting. But in terms of sequencing a novel strand of DNA to where we can definitively say that we have a a novel relic hominin on our planet. Now you're talking about six figures, at least a hundred. I was just going to say we haven't got the funding, have we? And and it's just a funding resourcing problem for researchers like myself and Paul. How are we going to raise that kind of money? And you only get one shot, so you might have what you you're convinced it's Bigfoot DNA, but you spend six grand or you know a hundred grand, and oh no, it's not. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's not. It's like, it's like yeah. now I'm broke. So yeah. yeah, so hopefully we'll get there and we'll get some funding. But I think that's I think that's the the secret there, Les, is we just need better better funding and support. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, great answer. Yeah, and uh, fills in a few gaps for me. Um, do you want some more questions? Are you? Uh, yeah, it's up to Ken. Is he, if he's happy to take them, it's good. Yeah. I don't mind. I've, I've got questions here, but I'm happy. The, yeah, these yeah, are the okay. people though. Isn't it? Let's buy them. Yeah, and uh, we do have a knowledgeable. Um, audience people in the chat ken so you know and we get some really really great questions uh mark mark clinchy is asking has ken ever been to mount shasta um i've been close to mount shasta but no i was not actually on mount shasta but i'd say i was within a few miles one time in northern california and i could see it kind of in the horizon and i guess where he might be going with this is there are allegations that mount shasta has you know all kinds of like we were talking about earlier some ufo activity concentrated and a of, zone of unexplained a lot of big bigfoot sightings and some other weird cryptids and things so but no unfortunately i haven't actually been on mount shasta if that's what they're asking me just close by okay, okay thanks hey, for that, ken. Uh, yeah uh, sam and rally is asking ken any bigfoot dogman sightings in turkey 
Um, interesting. Bigfoot or Dogman in Turkey? Well, um, I can't think of Turkey specifically off the top of my head. There is, um, there's of course a famous lake monster there in Lake Vaughn, uh, the Carvon. I can't remember the name. I'm sorry. It's in my book about the Loch Ness monster. Um, but as far as hominins, now close to Turkey, of course, we have accounts in places like Georgia and um, the Car Caucasus Mountains, of course, which is close by. You have traditionally a lot of sightings of Bigfoot-like creatures, and they're called the Almas, the Dev, the Kaptar. So close to Bigfoot and close by Turkey. I don't know about any dogman accounts from Turkey, Paul, but I know uh, Josh was telling me recently about one from somewhere in the Middle East, and I can't remember if it was, I think it was Lebanon, perhaps. But I don't know. Have you heard of any werewolf or dogman stories from I Turkey? Now you mentioned it. No, no, I haven't. No. So, Les, have we done with questions? Patricia Adams Wright is asking. What are Ken's thoughts on the Beast of Gavoran? I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. The Beast oh, of Gavoran. The, the, uh, not, the, the, not attacking Dan. animals. Gevaudan. Gevaudan. That, that's, that's what she means. I ah, yeah. I'm just, I'm just reading verbatim no, it's, what it's I've got, fine, that it's got fine, there. Yeah. But, you're, you're yeah, uh, uh, but not attacking animals, uh, but only attacking humans. People. Yeah, that is yeah, a weird. Yeah. It's a great story. Um, I did a special for the History Channel. People can probably find the the real Wolfman is what it's called if they want to find out about uh, my investigation in the Beast of Jevodan back in two thousand and eight and nine. Um, we did find when we were investigating that case in southern France, we did find, and I'm sure you, most of your viewers probably have heard the story of this wolf-like creature that allegedly killed over a hundred people in southern France in the seventeen sixties. There was a creature shot finally and ultimately by a guy named Jean Chastel with a silver bullet. And, um, but the, the carcass mysteriously disappeared, but there has been evidence that surfaced in recent decades that it may in fact have been at least partially to blame may have been a hyena, which is some people think looks like a wolf, of course, but yeah. it's not, but they tend to be more ferocious then uh, even wolves of that time, which were probably more ferocious than modern wolves, the wolf attacks did happen. Um, but you know what? Uh, there are theories that it could have been a serial killer involved, conspiracies involving the Roman Catholic Church and the, the French monarchy. And uh, I really think it could be a case of composite identity where you had a lot of different things that were kind of going on at the same time. Wolf attacks, conspiracies, maybe a serial killer, but perhaps an escaped hyena or something like that. But it is weird that it did not attack, as your viewers so astutely pointed out, all the killings occurred, you know, around livestock, sheep and things that you would think would be much more uh, targetable a than a human. So that, that kind of adds that slightly supernatural <laughs> it's, it's an incredible the, story. It, it, what yeah. a question that they're all going to be asking. So, yeah, thanks for asking that one, Pat. Good one. Uh, and, yeah, uh, and um, I've, I've got another question. Maybe we'll see it in. Um, Anthony Hudson is asking, uh, what does Ken think of uh, Melba Ketchum's work on getting the DNA tested? So th this is something recent, isn't it, Ken? Yeah, that was the study I talked about. Um, yeah. I, unfortunately, I don't advocate that mm -hmm. finding. And as I, I mentioned earlier, my friend, Dr. Haskell Hart, he actually has written a book. He's a, a He's not a geneticist, but he's a, a, a chemist, PhD from Harvard. And he did do a peer review of Melba's findings and basically found that they were not very convincing in terms of the findings. There were three strands of DNA that they tried to assign to this novel hominin, um, but apparently one was turned out to be a bear, one was a dog, and one was human, which could very well just have been contamination. Um, and I should say, and I don't know Melba Ketchum, and it's not my uh, position to necessarily question people's integrity or whatever, but just recently she's claimed, Paul, that she now has dogman or werewolf DNA and also mermaid DNA that she's trying oh, to get tested. Yeah. So she's a little bit far out there yeah, yeah. in terms of looking at things scientifically. So, I mean, that to me, that yeah. creates some issues, you know? Well, you know, we, obviously we're not going to have time because mermaid was going to be a question. But everybody likes to be scared. Everybody likes to hear scary things, Ken. And we've got a few minutes left. 
yeah. On investigations you've been in, when you've been in the forests, when you've been in th these locations, what's the scariest, most edgiest moments that you've had? There must be something, even though you didn't see anything. Yes, August 18th, 2003, I was with three other researchers uh, investigating recent Bigfoot uh, reports at a place called Cottonwood Lake in Texas. Just after dark, we were hiking kind of around the, the lake and suddenly we heard something grunting at us that I'm convinced was a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. It sounded like a huge ape, very powerful. I mean, it was literally shaking the brush, very deep. I actually recorded this because I had a, a camcorder going at the time. Um, we tried to flush it out. Only one of us was armed. Uh, at the time and he kind of got down and was trying to flush it out and we kind of formed like a little perimeter and I was going to try to film it if it came out. Um, he kind of backed out at some point. We couldn't see it. It was very heavy brush. Said, I'm not going in there on my belly, which is what he was having to do. So we camped out there and we did hear this thing throughout the course of the night kind of doing a moaning sound. It had moved to across the lake and it was kind of howling and moaning at us. <clears throat> very eerie. And then uh, the following morning, we did finally make our way through this thick brush where we had heard this thing was a little beach on the lake. <clears throat> and we found very deep human-like footprints um, and a number of turtle shells that were pretty good size, like that big, had been torn in half. And they right. were like, like, power, like pistachio shells that something had, there was no meat or any flesh, just the remnants of the shells ripped right down the middle. And I can't think of any animal uh, cave or human capable of doing that. And so all of that to me was very <clears throat> convincing. Um, I've also heard a Bigfoot walking bipedal. One time I was in a deer stand at a place called Monster Central in Louisiana, because there've been a lot of Bigfoot sightings at Monster Central. I was in this rusty old deer stand for hours with a video camcorder just kind of sitting there. <clears throat> and I heard something very loud walking bipedally through the woods next to me. I couldn't see it because of the, again, the foliage, but it was what, thunderous. You and know. was it one of those uh, cold water down back of your neck moments, real fear? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, it was pretty near right. I mean, I've, I've, when you're in the moment, and granted, Paul, I consider myself, you know, pretty crazy in terms of my obsession with finding these things. There have been times when I've run at what people claimed was a Bigfoot in the woods and I ran directly at it. And I thought, well, God, this is my job. I got to do this, right? Even if I'm pummeled to death. But yes, when you're in that moment and you're hearing something that you can't explain, sh well, surely anyone would be kind of okay, ner great. nervous and you, the little hair is standing up because it's like, it's happening right now. Yep. So I mean, that's kind of where you're at when that when that stuff happens. So. so Ken, we're just about up on hour now. So your books, where can people find information about you? Do you have a website? Thanks oh. again for having me on, Paul. I appreciate it. Yes, my website is kengerhard.com. I'm also on social media. People can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I have a YouTube channel. And if people are interested in my books, uh, go to uh, amazon.com. Um, you can find me there on my author page. I also sell a few of my books on eBay signed copies. And they, they do that international shipping with eBay where it's included in the price. So if you have any viewers over there overseas that would like a signed copy, go onto eBay and try to find me on there and we, we can maybe facilitate a signed so, copy. So for, for somebody you. that's not read any of Ken Gerhard's books, what would the starting book be? What would you recommend? Um, I think if people are interested in a diverse range of subjects, I would recommend one called A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts. Yeah. Uh, it does a little bit of Bigfoot, some Nessie, uh, werewolf sightings, the Beast of Javodan's in there, uh, dragons, giant spiders, giant snakes, black panthers, thunderbirds. It's kind of Mothman. It's kind of a little bit of everything I've investigated around the world and some of my personal experiences with those investigations. Ken, you've left us hanging, haven't you, really? Because there's, there's like four pages here. We were going to do spiders. We were going to do lake monsters. We were going to do sea serpents. But honestly, really appreciate your time and... Uh, what can I say? Thank you very much. And uh, providing, uh, will you come back? Yes, will let's you, do this yeah. again sometime. Let's and we do can this hit again those sometime, other, yeah. We'll hit those then, other topics for sure. I'd love to do that. That'd be yeah, brilliant. You'll, prob you'll probably find Ken, that um, no truth proof is on the stream, might want four hours from you, Ken. So I, I, <laughs> I don't know if you fix that. that. <laughs> 
All right. Well, no, okay. All, all good. So, Ken, from myself, I'd just like to say thank you, and I'm sure from the listeners as well. And me and Les will take it from here then, and we shall leave you to it. That, thank you to everyone who tuned in today, and uh, have okay. a great weekend. Bye. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care. Okay, I've just got a, yeah, I've just got a, yeah, I've got a caption on a screen while, uh, for the viewers, and uh, we are going to quickly reconfigure some screens here, so just, just bear with us. Yeah, we're still live, uh, we, we, yeah, we just got a caption on a screen, Paul, just to, uh, just to mask. This is... Me. Yes. Uh, any 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 more questions, guys? And uh, we're. Uh, I were up at four a.m. Yeah. this morning. If anybody's listening, uh, we had a bit of a UFO sighting. Uh, what date is it today? Is it this, let's have a look. It's the sixth, and it on the fifth. Yeah, the guy travelling to work. It's uh, approximately five fifty a.m. And he sees what I've always been raving on about: the light forms, and. Uh, yeah, an incredible sighting. I've seen footage. Really impressive. But I'll let you get this screen sorted, Les, so... Yeah, just bear with us, uh, listeners. And uh, I'll be there in a second. Yeah, it's all good. So, uh... I think we've just lost... Uh... Let's have a look. That's okay. Hmm. So we're going to... Have we lost the stream? No, we're still we're still streaming, Paul. It's just uh, we're just not getting a picture of you. Oh well, moment. don't worry. They, they know what I look like. So, people, uh, yeah, four a.m. I got up this morning. So, if you, if, I'm assuming you can hear me, and uh, I were up at Walgate Crossroads, just out of Bridlington, at about twenty past four, armed with a Sony camera. I've got the Psionics. I don't know what I thought I could do because I'd got three cameras and I took a little GoPro based on the fact that these ufos were seen yesterday now i do believe that, that what they saw because i've actually seen the evidence with the footage and there's there's a pattern that formed when myself and steve ashbridge were going up onto the walls uh, you know years and years ago going back from 2004 to 2009 and this is very close to the east yorkshire walls that if we were seeing these things usually it's happened over a number of days, even even a number of weeks, and then it just sort of stopped dead again. And it was a fantastic sight to, to, for, to see the world's UFOs, as I'd called them. And when I saw that footage yesterday, uh, this guy's travelling to work, as I've said. I'm not saying he's going to be listening to this. I don't think he's got any interest in the subject. A friend of mine, Gray Cooper, uh, allowed you got the footage and allowed me to see it. And uh, it's... It, Basically, the walk, the driving to work from Bridlington to through to Driffield, and there's two orange spheres in the sky, and these are intense. They look incredible, to be honest. The one that he's got on film, and the doing what we all do, they're spending a few minutes going, "Well, what's that? What could that be?" And then it dis they disappeared. They didn't fly away. They just disappeared, switched off. Then I think he said there was another one, and that did the same. And then there was a row of them higher up in the sky. And that's when he decided to get his phone out and film them. They'd gone by then and another one appeared. And as they're traveling this thing, I'm not saying it's pacing them in car, but you can see car passing all trees and fencing and everything. And there's this orange sphere. And as they come out of the fencing, you get a good view of it. And then it just literally it doesn't shrink. It just, just goes into distance like something from Star Trek. It's a great sighting. So I just had to get up there. I, I went to... Uh, happiest bunny world this morning getting up at 4am but I get up at stupid o'clock anyway and I sat up there I didn't take little dog with me and uh, got myself armed with a camera it was raining it was a little bit misty I probably already knew I was wasting my time but I was back home anyway at you know half past six seven o'clock so that's where we were at Les and please it is with some questions people because uh, as I say it's just gone to a slightly different format today with uh, Ken only being able to do an hour. So what are your views on that, Les? Any? Just like 
Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to reiterate. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to reiterate that uh, what you just said uh, about Ken, uh, great guest, and if we can get him on again, that would be even uh, better, you know, for a longer period because, uh, as you say, you had uh, you had a stack of questions already for him. Yeah. And um, but I hope that uh, everybody enjoyed the time that he was on with us. Uh, for that hour, and uh, I certainly uh, got some information out of that, uh, and probably you did as well. Oh, he's really knowledgeable, and and you know he's 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 really gone into the science aspect of the subject as well, and he's not just stayed in the woo. And I like the fact that, like he's like you said, Ron Moorhead, the guy responsible for recording the Sierra sounds, thinks there's more of a paranormal aspect to the Bigfoot than Ken does, but they can get on. You know, it's it's good that the camps aren't divided. Not everybody might agree with each other, but the camps are not divided. So earlier in the week, jumping from that, Les, I were on Cliff Tops with Bob Brown. I don't know if Bob's still in chat. He might want to add something to it if he is. And I, I took a Pulsar thermal camera with me, as well as my other stuff. And there's a scientific research vessel unmanned at the moment out of Bempton. If anybody knows what it's doing, please let us know. I don't mean that there's some kind of paranormal aspect to it or some mystical woo to it, but it's there. It's a black boat. I think it's called the X-20. There's a name to it as well. I can't... Uh, incidentally, it, it is called... I don't think it is. It is called the X-20. I've filmed it. I filmed it with uh, camcorder. However, when you go on to maritime shipping and look at the research vessel that's off Bempton, it's not the X-20. It's said called the X90, which I don't understand that <laughs> because, it, you know, I've typed in the whereabouts of this boat, the X20, and it doesn't say that it's at Bempton, but it is because I've got it on film. So it's, it's just going up and down. It's, it's armed with cameras and I think it's got a side scan radar on it or sonar on it. It's, it's just armed and it's it was close in under cliffs when I saw it. I were actually with Ben Walgate. And we didn't know what we were looking at, you know, from a distance. We thought it were a submarine, a small sub, because it's just black and kind of catamaran shaped. It looked odd. And then it's got this array of cameras on it. Managed to get it on film. So where am I going with this? It's been doing it for last, or at least the last week, but probably two weeks. And earlier in the week, I could see it out at sea. You can see its whereabouts. It's just moving up and down and it's about in line with Briel Nuk at Bempton and then it turns round and when it turns round there's a red light on it and you can see it turn and it's all when you put the thermal on it you, you can usually see outline of a boat but all you see is the lights from this equipment because it's lit up like a Christmas tree it's throwing a lot of heat out but what's interesting out at sea where this thing is on the thermal camera there's a long white tube under water a lot bigger than this object this 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 unmanned craft. So, oh, thank you. Cup of tea. That's great. Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Uh, so there's a, a long white tube under water, which I film for the best part of 15 minutes. And it's not, remember, a thermal camera, won't, you don't see light. So it's not some light off this, this unmanned boat that's casting on water. It only picks up an heat signature. So we're in North Sea and we're probably like five or six miles out and it's kicking out a lot of heat, this white tube. Or it looks white on thermal. And the craft just, the boat, the unmanned boat just disappears into distance and this is still there. I go all I go all the way with the camera right up to Bridlington and then slowly come back. There's nothing. You don't, I've not found any heat anomalies under sea ever until that night. It could be something to do with research vessel. There might be a, a little sub under there doing something as well I don't know but I found that bit a bit fascinating and yet I have got it on film uh, yeah fabulous so have we any questions in Les or yeah um, well uh, Ali's asking actually yeah, do we get an hour of Q&A with Paul Sinclair Please now do, because and if we do fantastic he's saying yeah I, I really I really don't mind I'm better at thinking on my feet than I am at just going through bits of paper if I'm being truthful so yeah just just find a way so I've got a, yeah I've got a question from Resi Tuber and uh, the question is does uh, air traffic control willingly engage in sighting investigations 
Uh, they may do. I don't know. Uh, I, I think everybody's more open to the idea that these things have to be investigated now. And pilots, I wouldn't say are encouraged, but they're allowed to report their sightings of UAPs or but want of a better word, UFO, which another name we've just rebranded for, for the same thing. So yeah, pilots are, are more open to reporting these things without the fear of uh, any any kind of uh, retribution, any kind of uh, comeback from their superiors. So yeah, I would have thought that they do they do investigate them. I would have thought for years and years all these things have been been investigated in the background, and uh, a lot of what they find out we're not going to get told. I mean, let's face it, it's took us. It's, it's took us best part of 50 and 60 years of searching around in archives and Ministry of Defence Freedom Information requests about UFO reports and getting a staple letter back. And I've, had, I've got plenty of them that these things uh, don't that, with, that have not been investigated because they don't pose any threat to the United Kingdom's defences. Yet then we find out years later that these things have been investigated and been investigated heavily. And now suddenly, after all this suppression, we're seeing these, the reports of unexplained phenomena, UFOs on the TV more, on mainstream news. And uh, why is that? Are we being prepared for something? Uh, and I don't mean some kind of alien invasion people, because I've really got no idea. There's no, there's no hidden clues in what I've just said. It's just, I find it strange that we've had a, decades upon decades of suppression and suddenly let's tell them let's tell the public they're ready for this next stage of whatever i'm going to say bull crap we're going to tell them kind of thing so yeah go on Liz. yeah well uh before you uh got into that last answer my first thoughts were air traffic control will directly contact mod oh, straight straight from the get-go yeah and uh, i think that's probably the protocol uh, what they use and uh, just to get onto what you just lastly uh, uh, alluded to uh, what the prime minister's for uh, well I think if you if you actually listen to the Pentagon uh, reports that have been coming out they're, they're actually saying there's a, an alien mother craft out there which is sending out smaller craft uh, so I don't know. I don't know where we're going with that one. So, so, uh, so how, how much is that of that is true, Les? That the Pentagon's put this out. Is it? I mean, I don't know because I, I, I don't read a great deal, to be honest. We are uh, what's on internet or what's on news, even or listen to what's on news. So is have we got some paper trail for, for that? Well, you've just got the internet searches, uh, right, Paul, okay. but I, I did actually read that last week, but I can't say where from at the moment. Okay, uh, no worries. Uh, uh, Tony D is uh, asking, um, do you think the UK has a Bermuda Triangle type area? Good question. Um, I suppose all parts of the world have got these areas. I think triangle is just a, a gimmicky word, uh, Tony, uh, because... How do we know it's a triangle? We can make a triangle out of anything. I mean, I could I could sort of start with Flambra Head and work back, and we've got a triangle area of strangeness. But uh, invariably, there's things happening outside of these triangles. Uh, you know, there's there's a there's a book out there called uh, the Wald Newton Triangle, and uh, which talks Wald Newton's close to us, and it talks about unexplained events and stories. But it's just a collection of other people's accounts and other people's stories uh, that go back decades i don't really see any uh, any real evidence of new accounts or new stories but what i'm saying is all all of what's happening in in that book and in my books is also it's spreading out it's not just in a triangular shaped area in my opinion i just think it's a gimmicky kind of word that uh, is used to Post television series and book book sales, maybe. Yeah, uh, I think just probably to expand a little bit on that. I, uh, I think probably I think what we would use the words we'd use is is kind of hot spots, you know, because obviously the area you're investigating has definitely got a hot spot, as as you know you've you've proved no end of times with the reports that you've found. Mm -hmm. uh, so other areas, I think, 
I think there was a hot. There's a hot spot in Wales. You know, you could. There's a hot spot in 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 Scotland. Definitely, uh, well, especially around the uh, um, the military base up there. They're everywhere. Uh, big military. You, yeah, naval base. You yeah. Know, I think everybody wants the area that they research to be the special place, and and just by doing these shorts that we've been putting out on YouTube, these two to four minute clips focusing on the sightings from the truth proof books and the reports. I think it's highlighted that Speeton, regardless of what anybody thinks about this, this little village, this nondescript village, when you get over them cliffs down onto Speeton, and I've said it before, that you don't get lots of footfall. Of course you get people down there probably every day, but compared to other beaches and other places, it's very remote. It's very difficult to get to. And, the amount of reports I've got, I, I think it's one of the strangest places on earth. I really do. I think it's got the full uh, that spectrum of unexplained phenomena occurring there. And I thought it was interesting what Ken said because I'd thought that myself. You know, when we talk about the witnesses who are saying, "Have you seen the film Harry Potter?" Uh, and, and and the werewolf from Harry Potter, and people are claiming to say it looked like the werewolf from Harry Potter. And it kind of makes you wonder if we are creating these things uh, with our minds. I know it's a bit of a, a jump to go on, but like, uh, like Ken touched on earlier, we don't know the true power of our own minds. It's like poltergeist activity. It does seem to grow in, in its, within, within its presence the more that we become aware of it, the more we focus on it. You know, first of all, there's little subtle things happening and we sort of think, oh, did that really happen? Did I imagine that? Did I just see that? And then you become aware of it and you start to focus on it. And suddenly it got, it moves from being almost amoeba-ish to having a little bit of intelligence. So there's almost a trickster element to it as well. It's it, fascinating. I, I'm really fascinated by the poltergeist uh, phenomena. Yeah, and uh, this, this kind of... Um, I think where I'm going in my mind a little bit here is Paul is uh, is when we're saying are we projecting this type of thing, you know when it comes to um, poltergeist activity, ghostly phenomena, but it involves young persons coming into puberty. Uh, do you see where I'm going? Yeah. So I I is this the attraction? Is this? I know it's not quite the same as what you was alluding to, but is this? It's kind of along that path where the energy is all focused into this person who was in this, in this time of life. Who, who could say? I mean, it's, I don't think it's just just teenagers. I think it's times, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's excited energy. I think it's emotional energy. You know, times of, times of great stress as well, you know, and loss. You know, there's a, I have a little story here that Mary, my wife, she's, she's not, She's, obviously, she's got to be interested a little bit in this because I, I don't leave the subject, really, do I? Although when I go in later, I'll not be talking about uh, unexplained to her, but I'll probably be on phone to somebody or writing something whilst, while she's watching TV. But years and years ago, when, when her, her mum passed away, and she'll not mind me saying this, uh, we, I remember us going, they lived in, a, in the mining town in Edlington, and we went into the house and her dad were in. And her dad said, she's here. She's still here. And we, we kind of said, what do you mean? I, I mean, the thing, first of all, the things that had happened to me in my life, I knew about, but I'd never shared with her parents and not a lot with Mary, really, and, until it started happening when we moved to Bridlington. So I want to get that bit out of the way first. It weren't some kind of, fool. Oh, we're all talking about the woo. He said, I've just been sat here, he says, and they had a coal fire and, you know, the steel poker. He said, it's just jumped up on earth. Said, OK, fair enough. Didn't think a lot to it. And then Mary said, I'm going to my dad's and I'm going to move my mum's clothes. There were a lot of clothes in front room. It, it, were, it were a terraced house and you, you, you literally walked in front door into the front room and then you went in and there's like a kitchen come living room. So she's in front room and... A, a brother was still living at house, her elder brother. She said, and uh, I'm, I'm folding clothes and putting them in bags because we're going to take them to a charity shop and things. She says, and I heard this noise, this, this humming noise, this. She says, this tone. She says, and I'm, I'm looking round. 
bearing in mind her dad said that he's hearing strange things and uh, this is not the same day she's not I, I focus on cabinet up at top and you know I don't know whether people have still got them in their house, but they were pretty popular years ago. You'd have a glass ca a cabinet with some drawers underneath and you'd put your darts trophies in if you played darts and snooker. And they had one of these cabinets. She says, on top of the cabinet, I can see some red air horns that you'd have for a push bike, you know, with the gas canister. But there's no canister attached. She says, and I've, I've sort of walked towards this noise and I reach up, I pick it up and I've, I've got it in my hand. And I can feel it vibrating and I can hear it humming, making this noise. These are just the plastic horns, no gas canister attached. She says, and I just walked into room where my dad was and said, listen to this, isn't it just stopped? Now, <clears throat> did she imagine it? I don't think she did. She's not, Mary's not got loads and loads of stories of the unexplained. Uh, but that's one that stuck in my mind that, you know, every, that there'd been a lot of emotional energy within the house you know, from from her brothers, from her, her herself, you know, she'd lost her mum and, and her dad's kind of grieving. And do, do we tap into the other side? Do we, is, is, is it in these times of great stress be, or, or elation, you know, uh, good times, do we actually tap into this other realm? You know, and there'll be people far more experienced than me that are able to give us their views on it. And I don't know. Just, just a little story, people, and uh, not sure if I've told anyone that before, but there you go. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I've just got a, well, perhaps a, an update for um, people on the stream is uh, something I asked you uh, a couple of, a day or two ago, and uh, in one of the streams you reported uh, you was getting a series of pebbles thrown across the room, yeah. uh, two or two o'clock daft times in the morning. Uh, while you was in bed asleep and which woke you up. So is there any update on that, Paul? It stopped, Les, and they, they weren't just well in early hours, although we did hear them in early hours. There's a lot of laminate in, in our our home, so obviously all that drops on it, you'll hear it. And I'll tell you, this, first, you'd hear them, singular ones, that just sound like a light switch going off yeah. and we'd, or, a, or a kettle switch flicking up. Or, or But then you'd hear the... And then... And it would skim along the floor. And we didn't really, I, I don't want to capitalise on it. We didn't do much at first. I just said to Mary, I said, did you hear that? She said, yeah, I did hear something. And and that was how it were. And then there were one in in the all in the hallway adjacent to where we watch TV. And it were literally outside. And when I, outside the door, and when I sort of opened the door, there's this little black stone on the floor. That alerted us to them, and I started uh, started collecting them. And I'm not sure how many I got. And they're only small. They're only small. And uh, remind me next week, Les. Because I mean, you're not looking at anything that looks uh, like a diamond. There's a little black stone. I'll I'll just offer them up and show you. But uh, yeah, so they've stopped. It, or it has yeah. stopped. Uh, 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 and for those not familiar with the with the history of your house, I mean, th th this sort of like comes hand in hand with some of the phenomena what's already gone on over the years, doesn't it, Paul? Yeah, and, and, you know, it makes you wonder if everything within our lives, everybody's, is kind of mapped out and preordained because I I had all these experiences through childhood till about 14, 15, and then it all dissipated. It seemed to stop. Little things would happen, but it was subtle. Uh, got married, <coughs> excuse me, had the four girls where we lived at various places in, in South Yorkshire. And I've no, nothing really notable that happened. And in 1993, we moved into the property I'm in now. And uh, I had to move up to it with our eldest daughter. She used to come up with me on a weekend because it had no hot running water. It just had cold water. And <clears throat> it were in a bit of a state, to be honest. And we had to get it all renovated. So Sarah used to come up and help me. Mary would stay at home with Little Ones and it took us two or three weeks working with a plumber to get some hot water on in property. But what, where am I going with this? Everything started soon as we got there. And I don't mean it started after we'd been in three or four weeks. It started. Sarah will recall being upstairs as a little girl, 11 years old. There's three three floors on this property, huge old Victorian house. And we'd hear talking. She'd say, Dad, can you hear it? And we'd be talking in, in one of the rooms and we'd go down. There's nobody there. We'd, we'd hear doors banging and you wouldn't see a door shut or bang. 
all sorts of things were happening in that house, but it happened straight away. We moved in, we'll say three weeks after doing so, just trying to get it ready. I mean, we had, we actually were penniless. We didn't have a penny when we moved in because we'd spent everything we'd got. And uh, so bear, bear in mind, all wallpapers stripped off. We were just living amongst it. You know, we were a lot younger and you, you sort of, you embrace them kind of things, don't you? Uh, so, right, we'd been in about a week and there's a knock on the door and we don't know anybody in Bridlington, bear, bear in mind. Open the door and there's a priest stood at door and he said, introduced himself and he said, my name is Reverend Tom Willis and I'd like to bless your house. And I don't mean I was shocked, I was a bit taken back, I didn't really, I mean, nobody had asked him. He said he'd done it several times before and he'd, he'd heard new people had moved in and he came in and he's talking in various parts of the house and working his way around, gets to top bedroom and says he, he would discourage anybody sleeping in that room. Uh, this guy could be looked up on internet. You know, they made uh, little films about him and all sorts. He was a proper exorcist. Uh, and our Sarah stood behind him. And, she, and she's like looking, her mouth's dropped and because that was her bedroom. So I asked him to leave. I was polite. But everything started from there. Now, the things that interacted with me in childhood, I think, were the same things that were, that started up when we moved there. But were they, were they aliens? I have no idea. Were they demons? I have no idea. Uh, they were alien. That's the word to anything that I know or understand. But uh, I know a long-winded kind of answer there Les and you've had to sit and listen to that I apologise people so yeah any more questions well actually just to sort of like round that little section off uh, you did tell me of a recent story of a neighbour seeing some some outland apparitions uh, uh, in your house behind the window that's in your correct. house that's correct that's Maria yeah. Maria who lives up directly opposite so she lives opposite and she so you tell people well, what she, she saw. she'd been very ill and uh, there's a huge landing on this property. I mean, it's five metres, or before I converted it to flats, it's five. it was five metres by about yeah. four metres wide. And that were all staircase, big grand staircase in it. You know, you could have fitted another three rooms in house with, with what they've used on staircase. So where am I going? There's two windows on landing. And she said while she was ill, she's laid in bed during the daytime. It's not night. And... Uh, now I've converted it to flats. One of those windows comes into the, the hallway of the middle flat. Yet she could see it in both windows. She said, and she can't believe what she's looking at. And she did watched it for, I'm sure she said, hours. And there were two figures, just the dark outlines that she could see as though they were climbing upstairs and passing the window and going down. Opposite, the stairs are behind us. There's no stairs for them to climb. It, it's a landing. And she said, and I watched them and I couldn't work out what I was looking at. And uh, it's intrigued me so much. I mean, I've spoke to her about it since and I, I, I would like to include it in some, uh, some future project. Uh, do you know what I mean? And, and obviously Bob Brown, Bob's in the top flat and he's had lots of experiences and strange things happening. Watching TV, how does this equate? When you're watching TV and you're three floors up, it says and a dark shadow just comes through a wall and walks across the room. <laughs> and uh, the girls have seen them things. I've seen them. My wife's seen them. We've, we've all experienced them things in that property. And th there's, a, there's a list. You could write a book about the strangeness. Once again, though, uh, when we moved in, and I think I've touched on it before with people, we were, as I said, we were emptying the property because it were all furnished. Uh, an old lady and a husband had lived in it for many, many years and brought their children up and the husband passed away. It'll make sense this in a moment, people, just bear with me. The husband passed away and she married a sweetheart from her younger years, remarried. Then she passed away and the property became his. So everything that was in that property was un kind of unrelated to him. The children's photographs on the sideboard, everything and when we bought the property we inherited everything like that all of it which had to be cleared to be honest with you but what's interesting is they've been spiritualists and they've been having seances in the property 
and there were bags, which and hence the reason probably why Reverend Tom Willis came to the property. The, he, he'd unearthed, so they'd unearthed something or disturbed something or invited something in. Uh, but there were bags, bin liners full of letters and it were all different handwriting and, and different coloured pens and strange things that I didn't understand and we didn't because I weren't involved in this subject. I knew what had happened to me, but I weren't involved in the subject in any deep way back in 1993 when we were clearing property and they were all spirit letters. It were all automatic handwriting. We have burnt loads and loads. I think we've probably only got two or three of them left before I understood what they were. So yeah, lots of things happened in that property. Yeah, uh, and uh, this is probably not even related, but uh, just a little uh, bit of information here. I think you told me that the house that you're in was the first one ever to be built on that piece of land. That's correct, yeah. We got deeds to property and it, where this is built was a field called Blackburn Field and the first property. So it's a terraced house, people. It's, it's not flash, it's a terraced house. A huge one, great big Victorian house. And, there's, and it's all built up around there. Yeah, we've now, got houses it? either side yeah. of us, but this one's red bricked Everyone. and all others are white bricked. But you, you see, we, we can't dress it up as anything else. It's not a detached house, yeah. it's a terraced house. But yeah, it was the first one built and there was nothing there for years. It was built by a guy called William Blackburn and it was on Blackburn Field. So yeah, I don't know quite what that means, if it, but uh, it's interesting. But there's loads, yeah. loads of research to the area. There's lots and lots of things that... If only time would allow. My problem is time, people. You know, because there's a there was a brilliant researcher back in the 1960s and 70s called Raymond Cass, and he was he were at the he was one of the most pioneering figures in EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Where did he live? Bridlington. Lived in Bridlington, and uh, he, he, initially he was an ear and <clears throat> audiologist, and. Uh, I got into electronic voice phenomena, EVP, and there's, there's there's quite a bit on internet about him. I think there's the Raymond Cass Institute and Foundation. I'm not sure when he passed away, uh, probably the 1970s. But what I find fascinating is Raymond Cass talked about, because I've seen it, I've read it, talked about a strange aerial phenomena off the coast of Bridlington, Flandreham, Bempton. Even back then, and this guy, that weren't his chosen subject. So, you know, the area's got a, a rich history of strangeness, and I don't think I'm the person that's un unearthing it solely. There's a lot of people being here before me. Right, Les? Yeah, I've got a question from uh, Lee Roscoe, and uh, oh, fascinating, that ball. No, no, it's sorry. absolutely fascinating. Um, no, I'm glad you said Lee Roscoe. that, I just thought I were talking to myself. <laughs> just carry on, Les. Yeah, Lee Roscoe is asking, just, we, we, he's taking us back to the Bigfoot. Uh, why do we get Bigfoot prints, but not hand prints? That's a great question, that. Has he got any theories on that? Well, well my theory would be, Lee, and I'm a, once again, I know no more than anybody else, but these things are walking bipedal, aren't they? They're not, I know we've, we, we do get reports of them sort of running on all fours, but if you're walking on two legs, you're going to leave prints in, in soft earth. You're not going to leave hand prints. That's that's about the only thing I could think. You know, I don't know. It, it still fascinates me that so many people talk about the way these things move and this this almost gliding motion. And I I jump straight back to the mountain bikers in Howard Dale, and they're travelling down that logging road and excuse me in the brush at the side of them, thirty feet away. All the divots. I mean, Les knows what it's like in them forests now, and, and, and I do because I went down went up to my waist in it. Then I Les Ste just stepped into what looked like a little puddle, and I'm in. I'm, I'm up to my waist, and this thing's just gliding down. And then our, our our amazing witness for Wolflands, the gamekeeper Jeff. I mean, it, it th that man says it as it is. He's, he's the most straight up guy you're gonna meet, and he said it when it come out of the forest, it didn't walk down. It arrived. <laughs> I didn't see no shoulder movement. I didn't see nothing. It just, just arrived. That takes these things into some kind of other realm to me. I know Ken wouldn't agree, and I, I, I absolutely respect the guy, uh, but that's just where I am with it. <clears throat> yeah, and um, when um, yeah, that's fascinating. That uh, just gliding through and not actually seen walking. 
because a lot of people on a lot of reports, and this is like kind of worldwide, but most probably predominantly in America, when they see these things, they don't hear hear anything. They don't any hear any brush snapping underneath them or anything. So that and it, and it almost makes you wonder, Les, because do, when when you do hear things, are they doing it deliberate? And when you do see them, are they choosing to be seen? Do, do, do you know? Uh, jump into our documentary Wolflands once again, the mountain biker Sam, he'd been for a 28 mile bike ride along the moors and through the forests and entered one of these forests as it was getting, as it was dark, wasn't it? He said all you could see were the white chalk road and this thing burst out of the forest at the side of him and mm. he, he didn't even see it, but it's literally within 10 foot of him and it's running as he's yeah. And, and that one, and that one, paradoxically, uh, uh, he did hear. He did hear. Oh, that that's one, what I'm saying. Uh, Do yeah, these yeah. things choose to be heard? Yeah. I th that was a fear factor. When he eventually screamed and started swearing at it, whatever it was, it just stopped. That was nothing. Interesting. And we were there uh, actually <laughs> earlier <laughs> in the week. So yeah, Al Alison Buttle, uh and uh, Alison, I know you're uh, away on holiday. Oh, is she? I Have think, a great time, yeah, Alison. Yeah, for the weekend, I think. I hope I'm not giving anything away there, Alison. No, and uh, Paul, have you got an update on Wolf Lands? Well, yeah, I think we have, actually. I mean, uh, 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 Mick Park and his, his co-worker, Nick Britton, and my daughter, Jess, and her husband, Nick, as you know, as we've been talking about for weeks, have been working on music, and it's mammoth. The, even the music's mammoth. It's it, it stands alone from film, and uh, obviously it's it's been it's bespoke everything. It's not just a, some kind of overlay and sort of what's what's the word when you just get the music to buy and just shove onto the top of a documentary. This is all everything's been built into the film. So where am I going? He told me that they'll have finished the music on Sunday. Then they've got some more mixing to do. So as i said weeks ago and as les said weeks ago our part of it is done we're just waiting for that music but it, i'm sick of saying it people but we're close we're, we're really close and then we've got to place the film because you know there's three years of work gone into this and uh loads of arguments with les and uh all sorts of things haven't we but we've we managed to get through it and uh we've still come out with a smile on his face and we're happy No, oh, yeah, fair enough. Well, we've got to do because otherwise you would never get out done, would you? You know, I don't mean you. I mean either of us. You wouldn't get anything done, and I think that applies to everybody in all walks of life. When you know, when you have a disagreement and you walk, it's time to not do any work together again. And that's why this week uh, we've we've not got a working title for another project. Uh, but we've been kicking ideas around. We revisited the forest this week. It's not all going to be forest-based, Les, is it? No, and uh, what we'll do a little bit, I know I've put... put, put um, no, it's not going to all be forest-based uh, to answer your question, Paul. Uh, we'll put a couple of stills on there uh, today, I think. But there is a little video to describe of uh, to describe what uh, types of things we are looking at in the... Uh, in a future project, yeah. so that'll be quite interesting. And, and we've, we've bought new cameras to try and up our game. And, and I need to just bring Chris Turner into this as well, because, I mean, Chris has been enormously helpful to me and, and, and to us both. I mean, he's a great guy and I am going to do a bit of work with Chris, but I can't work for three years with Les on Wolflands and then just say, that's it, I'm now doing stuff with Chris. We'll, 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 we'll be doing it in conjunction. I've got a few things that I'm going to pick up from a few years ago with Chris. So, yeah, all, all good. And, and what we want is other people's input. If there's people, anyone sat here listening to this, looking for answers to your own kind of puzzle because of what's happened to you and you think that you'd like to reach out and share that, please do. You know, and if, if anonymity is what you require, that's not going to be a problem. You know, it's a given. But... Uh, only by sharing these stories and sharing these encounters are we going to get other people bold enough to come forward and share their own. Yeah, so that kind of sort of like leads me into uh, into this little segment where uh, if you can just advertise and do a little bit of um, 
uh, promotion of your your website and what people can do when they get there and some of the books that you produce. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I've been a bit slow to be honest with you lately, and I'm slow at posting things out as well. I never share on other people's pages, and I see everybody on the My Truth Proof page putting the books up and things, and I don't put my own on. So the Truth Proof books, there's four books, obviously starting from the first one to number four, and there's the Night People. And they're on the website, truthproof.uk. Lots of UFO reports and unexplained phenomena reports, big cat reports on there as well that will be unique. Well, you'll not find them anywhere else uh, because they've come to that website. Um, Don Lodge puts the website together. Any reports that come in, we kind of discuss whether they're worthy of going on on website and I, I don't say that lightly most of them are great reports but sometimes you get some things which are quite obviously chinese lanterns or just some kind of i don't know dust or blown up on a camera and somebody's trying to say it's something else so we don't bother with them but yeah truthproof.uk and the the paperbacks that's where you're going to find them and on uh, ebay and you can get the kindles on amazon and uh I've kind of got plans to do audio books as well. So, you know, it's it, time. Time is, is my thing. Half past four now in the morning, I'm getting up at stupid o'clock. And I thought I'd be dead on my feet today, but I feel OK, because last few mornings I've been up just after four o'clock. Yeah, well, that whiskey helps, doesn't that, it, Paul, no, during it's, the day? It's, it's water today, Les. But, oh, is it? Yeah, oh, right. Uh, yeah, OK, I got a qu- I've got something from uh, David Smethurst. And uh, welcome to the show, David, if you're still with us. Uh, does Paul think that the thing seen at Bridlington is linked to some kind of other stroke ET, stroke crypto base, stroke home, where if you get close, you are... You are the subject to creatures craft portals from the same tech. Now, that is a mouthful there, David, but I tried to make my best of that one. Do you understand that one? Uh, Not fully, uh, David, to be honest with you, but uh, if you get close, uh, and this could apply to anywhere in the world, if you look deep enough into these things, then it starts to look back at you. And I think I might have got wrong end of stick when you, you know, and Les read it and how how you've wrote it, uh, David. So I'm sorry if I have, but... uh, yeah, I think you can get too close and you can get some kind of attachment. And just jumping from that, I need to, because I need to just acknowledge, thank you very much, whoever sent me that. I know who sent it. Incredible information and uh, I, I appreciate it. I, I get, I'm getting all sorts of things sent to me at the moment. That's signed for that one. And uh, I didn't even know it were coming. And that's just another bit of information. But. Can we get too close to this? Yeah, I think we probably can. And uh, I think a lot of people have in the past. Uh, and it's the stories of men in black. And it's the story, you know, I've, let's just inadvertently did somebody get too close. I think it was 1963 when uh, the men in the imperialist, three fishermen in the little fishing cobble, uh, off Crab Rocks, which is just under Bempton Cliffs, all in their pots, saw this sphere of light in the water, and they looked, and it's just above their heads, and then it's flown away, like baseball-sized sphere of light. Where am I going with this? When they got back to shore, 1963, no mobile phones, nobody knew they'd seen this thing. They get back to shore, Flamborough, little fishing village, there's men waiting to speak to them like men in black type, men in suits, we'll say anyway, because they didn't say it, you know, men in black. But the way to, how can that be? How does that work? You know, who could have known? And what technology did we have back in 1963, the the size of a baseball that could be silent, glowing milky white colour above their heads in daylight and then just zip off? But I think even more interesting is the fact that people were waiting for them when they got back in their fishing vessel the, the imperialist uh, that's fascinating and i and then i have spoke they're, they're all elderly but i i have spoken to, uh, to to one of them and got the story it's the guy i found it fascinating because proper yorkshire dialect and it was tom quinn one of the fishermen that you've met tom les uh he put me in onto this guy uh, tom and his brother dave They've got a lot of respect on the arbor in Bridlington. You know, they've been fishing for many years and that that helped me a lot to get 
to speak to a lot of these fishermen. It's not like what you know, it's who you know kind of thing. And I knew about this story and I, I asked him if he knew these men. He says, yeah, he says he comes on to Arbor in his mobility scooter still and uh, he sits and just talks to lads and things and he put me onto him and I asked him about it and I was asking him how big this object was that were above the, their heads and, uh, and he went third ball what? he says third ball and it's, it's a football you know what I mean and, and it's typical sort of Yorkshire dialect and it was a third ball but yeah fascinating and th th these people a lot of these stories are just going to the grave with people, you know. Uh, there's, there's, there's far more spectacular things happen to people than have ever happened to me, you, and a lot of people watching this now, and they're just taking them to the grave, and it's such a shame. So, Les? Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating because um, when we was talking earlier with Ken uh, uh, about folklore and, and things like that and how much gets passed on from folklore, so you could assume, really, because a lot of these stories never come out, mm -hmm. that have, you know, there's only about one percent of what should be in the folklore ever, ever we ever read about. Yeah, without a doubt, you, the percentage that that's out there must be great. And we're only hearing a fraction. I mean, I, I, we're looking into things in in for Wolflands, and we're still searching for new material. And somebody contacted me about three or four months ago uh, to tell me that there's somebody, I'm not going to say where, because I, I realise that, uh, I don't mean I own all the research, but if you're looking into something and somebody's been good enough to come and tell you, I'm not just going to give information away so somebody else can go and frighten these people off or whatever. But uh, there's an old lady who lives close to these forests, who, very old, who's got a lot of knowledge of what people want to, if you want to call it the werewolf phenomena, that's what you you would call it and uh, i'm still waiting i'm still hanging on and waiting and we've got another story and i'm not going to go into great detail about it but where the gamekeeper had his encounter uh which you'll find out about in wolflands probably less than a mile away not probably less than a mile away there's another abandoned farmhouse and a, and a guy contacted me about two months ago to say that he went on a school trip there Back in the 1990s, guess what? Similar experience. Not just him, other other school children as well, and the teacher. So I'm 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 sort of eagerly waiting to hear more about this. So, so the reports are out there. There's a there's another house, and when I say house, we, we, when we're in these forests, you know, you might you might have a mile between properties. They're really remote and they're on logging roads, but logging roads. And there's another property where the guy who lives there still, and I've spoken to him several times, he wants me to go through and see him. And I, people might have heard me say this. He claims that on several occasions, he stepped out of his back door during the night because he's been woken up. He says, and if you told me there was a pride of lions in the forest fighting and roaring, he says, I wouldn't believe you. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're absolutely in the middle of nowhere. You've just got forest and more. It's only happened a couple of times. And they're not mugs, the people that live in these locations. He's got a, a, a water course at the bottom of his garden. So he's used to seeing the deer. He's used to hearing the deer when they're in rut and they're, they're barking and, and roaring. So it's not that. These aren't, these, whatever is in the forest or has been, sounds like a pride of lions what is it it's incredible i don't believe that there's something like that living and breathing on a permanent basis in there it's fascinating that that story comes out and then we've got our stories from wolflands and now potentially we've got another one it just rolls i i, I find it exciting people i really do david smithurst is asking does paul think there is a um an other slash ET base under the cliffs in Bridlington? Uh, well, not under, there's no cliffs in Bridlington, David. So you, 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 this, this, the cliffs start at Sobe and they become sort of clay and a bit earth and rock. And then as you go on towards Dane's Night, you've got cliffs. And then obviously you've got them at Flamborough, Bempton, Buckton and Speeton. But uh, I don't know. I wouldn't know. Uh, I'd only be speculating. I've, I've had people 
tell me that they've seen spheres of light appear to go into the cliff. But that I, I don't think for one second that there's some kind of door that opens up that allows aerial vehicles to enter the cliffs. I really don't. Uh, I, I don't know what it is. And let's face it, if these things can pass through walls, if these people who claim to have been abducted by, we'll call them aliens, not aliens necessarily from outer space, but just aliens, alien to what we know and understand, if they can appear in somebody's bedroom or in somebody's property during the night through a locked door and through a wall, then they could pass through brick, whatever the technology is, it can materialise or dematerialise if that's what's happening. But whether there's a base, I don't know. A lot of people have speculated that there's a base out in the North Sea. And a remote viewer messaged me to say that they remote viewed. But I'm talking about it, of course I am. But to talk about it in any depth with any great belief, I think I'd be wrong because I've no proof of it. And, and and any more than I've any more proof of what I'm talking about with the creatures, but at least with the UFO sightings and the and, and the creature sightings, we've got multiple witnesses. And that, anyway. Um. Yeah, and I think just to sort of like add to that, um, do you think there's any uh, under, undersea bases? Now, I remember um, uh, Bob. Uh, well, we've seen the lights under the sea. That's where you're going, isn't it? Yeah, well, no, and he heard a rumbling under his feet. Yeah. You, heard, you felt that. Uh, uh, you felt that under your feet as well. There's a few people when that can vouch for that. So there's, there's, I've had loads of reports, loads and loads of rumbling, underground rumbles that have come to me to the website and come to me. And myself and Steve Ashbridge stood on Cliff Lane probably in 2018. Uh, stupid o'clock. Midnight, I don't know, just before, just after. And the rumbling, there were two huge rumbles under the, under the ground. And I've, I used to work at the Exhibition Centre in Birmingham. If anybody's been into the Exhibition Centre, these great big, yeah. great big sort of pre-built buildings to put uh, kitchen exhibitions in and all sorts of things. But when they strip it out, which is what I were involved in after we'd built the exhibitions, because I worked as a joiner, it had big machinery in removing stuff and if they dropped it in these empty hangars the sound the, the reverberation of the sound it were really loud and it kind of it, it was almost like they were dropping concrete beams underground you could hear it yeah really yeah. really loud and bob's heard it as well yeah and, and i think even to add more onto that i think bob uh, and i'm sure he won't mind me saying because uh uh, he said uh, he was in contact, was it with a clairvoyant, who said there is actually, I think it was a, a female, she, uh, said, uh, yeah, there's definitely tunnel, tunnels under there. Yeah, he, he was. Is that right? He was, and I'd, I'd pro probably jump into the Ken camp here. No disrespect to Kenny, but I'd, I'd, I'd just term it like that. I, whilst I believe there's something to the spiritual as aspect of it and the clairvoyance, I just don't, I'd need more proof than I wouldn't, than somebody sort of saying, look, I've, I've, re I've visited these places in my mind, you know, some kind of outer body experience or however this process works. Uh, I'd need more proof myself. I'd want to, I'd want somebody to describe the inside of a building to me that they'd never been in. And then I might have a bit of faith in someone that they're telling me that, that, I, that I can't see and they yeah. can't see. You know, if you've got some proof that they could actually do it, then you'd have a bit of faith in it. And that's no disrespect to this lady. But, uh, you know, rumblings underground implying that there's some kind of cavern or something under there. Yeah, because I've, I've heard it myself. Steve's heard it. Bob's heard it. Uh, a clairvoyant telling me that they've visited this place in the mind and there's an alien base. I don't know. Uh, go into our, a room in our house and describe something for me, please. And then I'm more likely to believe you. Sounds bad, that, doesn't it? But uh, that's where I'm at. It. Yeah, uh, let's have a look. Then I'm, uh, let's say, let me go and check on the, uh, the time with about six or seven minutes to go, I think. Um, right then, so we have a question from... Um, oh, Richard White saying, uh, Anthony Peake would be a good guest as he sometimes talks about the human mind bringing entities into existence. He'd be an amazing guest. Well, what a guy to... to have you, anybody's ever listened to his podcast, I urge you to do that. And, and 
you know, thank you, Richie, for, for the information that you sent me. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, uh, you know, once again, info just pouring in from all over the place. It, it, it might look organised, even with these pictures at back, but it just looks like a bomb's exploded if I put camera around, which I won't do. Uh, but, yeah, uh, yeah, he'd be an excellent guest. And Yeah, he would. Any new listeners to the stream or listening to us now, please just like and subscribe, will you, please? We're trying to grow in numbers. Let's get this snowball building so that we can get more reports, we can put more information out. And we obviously, you know, it's not just it's not just a base where people come. I, I'm after, I want to just build the database as regards what people are seeing and experiencing and know that they've got a safe place to come to share the information. Uh, you know, I might not always understand it, but one thing you will get is my honest opinion, and you will get anonymity if that's what you want. So, and uh, once uh, Alison and uh, Skyflower, thank you very much as well tonight. You know, for uh, all support that you give us all the way through, and everybody else. I mean, Blue Shift, yeah. Rob, Shane, yeah. Richie yeah. White, yeah. you know, Adam. It's, it's great. I'm I'm, I'm going to miss names. Fred, Tony, Tino. Yeah. So it's yeah. brilliant. And great support, as you say, and uh, yeah, it does really support the uh, the um, the figures, the metrics, as it were, uh, on the stream, which is, uh, as we say, we're trying to grow, because at the end of the day, um, yes, we don't compare ourselves to other people's streams, obviously, but we do take notes of figures and and uh, subscribers on other streams. And uh, we, f we feel as if this is a bit of a slow burner. Yeah. So anything you could do to help us, get it out there, share it, repost it, do whatever. I don't know whether I've got... Oh, thanks, Les. I don't know whether I've got time to do this. And I don't normally read from bits of paper because I think it's best if you can just let your mind flow. But this is a geophysicist that sent me a report. Right, OK. And so it might... So I'll not be looking at camera people. So it was, it was from November 25th, 2016 that this happened. And he's at the location. He says, location, RSPB Wildlife Centre, Bempton. Latitude, longitude, 51.8. He's, he's give us, we don't need to go through that, but he's give us that and his phone number. Meteorological conditions, some, uh, some stratus patchy. Temperature, uh, approximately uh, uh, centigrade, approximately. Uh, wind southerly, 5, 8 miles per hour. Visibility, sky clearing, 80% clear cloud. Seeing conditions good, except on the horizon where there was some patchy mist out at sea. So just, it'll not take long, this, people, we'll, and it'll just about wind us up. Description. Uh, this is just give us uh, initials. I've got his name. A and E. A and E and R and C arrived at Bempton Wildlife Centre at 1800 hours approx. It was quite dark at this time and the sun set at 3.45 approx. So you can see we've got some... He's, he's done his own work. We had been observing the night sky for 10 minutes when we made our way to the bird viewing gallery 100 metres away from the centre. Looking out to the horizon, AE observed a number of orange stroke red lights in a row between three and six lights. I mean, don't this sound familiar? It was difficult to make out any silhouette as they emanated from the misty part of the horizon to the east. Given our elevation of 130 metres, this should give a distance to the horizon of 40 kilometres approximate. Uh, the lights appeared to blink independently of each other, but this may have been caused by the viewing conditions. At one point, a bright white flare looking object appeared to launch from its right hand side at 45 degrees in a straight line towards the clouds. I lost contact with it less, in less than one second. It moved very quickly. The flashing object then appeared to, to lift up to its left-hand side and rise at, 45, at a 45 degree angle. Uh, 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 and it lifted for approximately 500 feet for 10 seconds, approximately. Again, then resuming to its previous, condition, uh, previous position. All visual contact was then left locked lost after approximately 10 minutes there was no noise during this contact now i, I know it it don't make him a better observer but it just shows the caliber of people that are reporting things that have found that have found something that just don't quite fit the norm so geophysicist so I, I just find it fascinating people the more the merrier just keep firing the information at us so we look like we're just about on time and I'd just like to say thank you very much to everybody who's uh, 
come to listen to us tonight. I hope you enjoyed Ken. I hope you've enjoyed this last hour of me rambling on and Les firing a few questions at me. And as far as I'm concerned, good night. Uh, I've got to say thanks for all the questions. Uh, knowledgeable audience again, Paul, I always say. Mm -hmm. And uh, intelligent questions, as always. There. So we've got to thank Sky for doing a moderating tonight. And uh, we've got to thank Ken, obviously, for coming on as the guest in the first hour. Who we got on next week, Paul? Uh, I wish I knew. <laughs> Seriously. I, I knew you'd say that. Yeah, uh, we, I we've wish not I got knew. anybody lined up yet, have uh, we? We, but, we uh, haven't, but uh, no doubt we will. And if we don't, I'll make sure I've got enough information to share. And th here's the thing then, people. Fire some questions at myself and Les during the week and uh, we'll make sure they get answered next week, I assure you. And uh, you know, that would be a good start. And, and if we if we did get enough after this stream, I'll not look for a guest next week. We'll we'll definitely do what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll just. Uh, but in the meantime, our uh, our fifty pence is run out of the meter, and uh, it looks like we're going to see you all next time. But we'll definitely be on the stream next week, uh, guest or no guest, as Paul said. So on that note, it's goodbye from me. Goodbye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye now. See you all next time.